Today may be deja vu all over again. Matt Rajansky, who was director of the Kennan Institute at the Wilson Center, was here two years ago to talk to us about the Ukraine, and he is back to talk about the bigger Russia. His bio is in the materials, and recent events, again, has made his presentation extremely timely. There are the DNC emails, possibly hacked and released by the Russians, Olympic doping, and on this past Monday, uh, Matt's article on the risk of unintended U.S.-Russian conflict appeared in World, the World Politics Review. The article began by saying, a war between Russia and the United States is more likely today than at any time since the worst years of the Cold War. To finish the rest of that thought <laughs> and shed more light on these issues, please welcome back, back Matt Rajansky. Well, there's nothing like a Bob Stein intro, and uh, there's no place quite like Steamboat Springs, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, this time, I've been able to bring my father with me. Um, so I'm, have me back a third time, and I'll even get my kids. Um, it's always beautiful here, and, and there's something, I think, about talking about these weighty, uh, difficult, troubling, uh, often issues in an environment like this that maybe puts us in the right frame of mind at least to think long term. Uh, the world's a complicated place, and that thought that Bob introduced to you is an equally, maybe even more complicated one, and, and so I'll take my time in getting to it, but I promise that I will. Um, thank uh, the Steamboat, uh, the seminars at Steamboat Committee and the sponsors, um, Bob, Kate, uh, all the members of the, of the committee. This is uh, really a great opportunity at the right moment. Uh, I realize I have some stiff competition tonight. Uh, I understand someone may be giving a speech uh, very soon after this. Um, we do have something in common, though, which is that the Russians have hacked both of our email accounts. <laughs> so uh, if you don't make it to catch the speech later, you at least heard one person who's in the crosshairs. Um, can I just do this? I, I, I did this last time. Give me a show of hands. Uh, who here has been to Russia or Ukraine? My goodness. That is, that is astonishing. Uh, th I, there's something in the water in Steamboat Springs, I'll tell you that much. Uh, and how many of you were, were here for my lecture two years ago about the Ukraine crisis? All right, this is fantastic. So not only do you have more experience on the ground in the region than the U.S. intelligence community, and I'm not exaggerating that. <laughs> You're also, and I say this with nothing but humility, far better informed already. So, so let's get right into it. Um, who are these people? Who are the Russians, and, and what do they think? Uh, politics, uh, the popular press casts us as diametric opposites uh, and seems to always have done so. And of course, Vladimir Putin has played right into that. But in actual fact, uh, we have much more in common than you might think. First of all, we are truly unique in that we are both continental nations. This is important in having formed our national psyche. Think about manifest destiny, go west, my son, with a Russian version of that. Just 100 years or so before, the endless tracts of Siberia stretching all the way to that very same Pacific Ocean. In fact, it was George Kennan the Elder, not the famous diplomat, but his elder relative, uh, for whom my institute was named when it was founded 43 years ago. That was at the insistence of George F. Kennan, the ambassador. And Kennan was one of the earliest American explorers of Siberia in the 19th century, so I feel in some way I'm a part of that legacy of connectedness. Both of our great countries have seen themselves repeatedly as saviors of Western civilization. Think of Napoleon, World War I, World War II. And of course, both see themselves as having a unique civilizational mission. The city on the hill, the third Rome, that is Russia. Russians even argue that rather than having brought communism to the world, they saved the world from communism. They experienced the misery of Bolshevism, and they themselves rejected it so that the rest of the world did. You think about this, there's actually, it's not, it's not that nutty. Um, so there's a sense in which both countries have this sort of distinctive mission, this distinctive identity. So do we in fact have a values gap, as so many have argued? I would say, no, we just have differences of punctuation and sequence. <laughs> But punctuation, punctuation matters. 
and sequence matters. So let's talk a little bit about those values that shape the way that Russians, now let's start with ordinary Russians, the man in the street, the way that they see the world. And here the order is very important, so pay attention to where I begin and where I end. Number one is to live decently. Stability, prosperity, basic freedoms, and by that measure, there is no question that life is better in Russia today than it has been at any time in Russian history. Any time in the last 20 years, any time in Soviet times, any time in Russian imperial times. Now that said, there's a long way the Russians need to go on development and modernization. But they live decently. Number two, they want to be Russian. They want to be Russian. We want to be American, French want to be French, they want to be Russian. Now that's not exclusive of also being European or being Western, but it is distinct and it's important to understand that. Remember the civilizational tradition from which Russia comes. You cannot study the canons of Western literature, music, art, science, I don't care what it was, without studying products of the mind and of the spirit that have come out of Russia. And then of course, Russians want to be respected as Russians and for what Russians have accomplished in here, the tone of disregard Westerners often take if they even think about the role of Russia in the, the great victory in World War II that liberated Europe from the scariest, most murderous ideology the world had ever seen. This is deeply offensive to Russians and it's taken as a rejection of their very Russianness. But then lastly, and again the order is important here, Russians actually do value freedom, right? This might be shocking to Ted Cruz who spoke all about freedom and so forth just a week ago. Um, imagine, what, Russians? No. Actually, Russians do value freedom. They just think about freedom and the order of those values a little bit differently. Personal freedoms come first. The freedom to travel, which was not always taken for a given in Imperial Russian times and Soviet times. The freedom of speech, the freedom to practice their faith. And then, of course, political freedoms too. But there is no Bill of Rights in Russia. There is no First Amendment. And so the understanding of how those freedoms measure up one against the other, the old social contract, my freedom to swing my arm ends where your face begins, that balance is struck a little bit differently in Russia, and Russians think about it differently. All right, now that's the man in the street. How does the Russian elite see the world? Think about, first of all, who these people are. So if they're folks who are, broadly speaking, between the ages of 50 or 55 and 70 or 75 today, where were they 25 years ago? when the Soviet system collapsed. They were at this phase of their career. They had invested, they had studied, they had worked, they had served, and they were about to come to that plateau where everything was a golden sunshine. And then it all fell apart and they lost everything. They lost rank and they lost privilege and they lost status and they lost respect and in some cases they lost livelihood and health and those that they loved. And so for these people, I'm not trying to create a deep well of sympathy for these guys. Vladimir Putin's one of them, right? No love lost there. But for these people, the world is fundamentally a place where things like that happen. The world is a dangerous and scary and unpredictable place. And not only that, it's a place in which when those bad things inevitably happen to Russians, the West doesn't really care. In fact, sometimes we, we experience a bit of schadenfreude about it. Huh, look at that. We won the Cold War after all, you guys deserved it. This is the perception. This is the understanding that is core to the worldview of the Russian elite. And then, of course, there's the dependence of the Russian state's budget on energy exports. And the one thing that we can all say with certainty about energy exports is that the price will fluctuate. And what that means is, because it's fundamentally unpredictable, their ability to do anything, their ability to pay for anything, to project power, to buy off votes from their people, it all depends on something that's fundamentally unpredictable. And then, of course, there's the increasing centrality of the Russian state. Le état c'est moi. Vladimir Putin is a tsar. And we need to understand him as such. And that's not necessarily a bad thing for many, many Russians, and certainly for the Russian elite, who are the new boyarstva, the new, the new nobility around Vladimir Putin. Not a bad thing at all, but the more central the state becomes and the more it eats up the functions of the private sector and civil society and the church and everything comes under that one edifice, the more fundamentally unstable the system becomes because one crack in that foundation and there's no portfolio theory, there's no resiliency, there's not a pillar out there of, of voluntarism waiting from the people to save the state. No, if the state collapses, Russia collapses. 
And that's a very scary thing for the Russian leadership. So the world is a scary and a dangerous place from the perspective of the Kremlin. But at the same time, Russia belongs at the top table for all important global decisions. Now the Russians understand their relative economic and perhaps even military power, certainly their population vis-a-vis -vis China, has weakened dramatically. They can no longer be the senior partner, as you see here. They understand they can't be the senior partner with the West, but they do expect equality, and they will not sacrifice what they call independence. Russia's independent foreign policy position is an absolute priority for the Russian leadership. And so as a result, Russia slots into this role that we see over and over and over again of a middleman, a broker, and sometimes a spoiler when it comes to these third party major international crises, whether it's Syria, Ukraine, where they've been involved directly and indirectly, whether it's in Latin America, where they have stretched their tentacles, or East Asia, where they're a member of the uh, Korean uh, denuclearization talks, they become a key middleman and a broker. And then, of course, lastly, Russians believe that they are fundamentally rational, whereas the West demonstrates hypocrisy. What examples do they marshal? Well, some of them aren't so bad. On human rights, we berate Russia endlessly. We pass legislation to punish them and sanction them because of things like this pussy riot demonstration where a bunch of basically punks went up to the sacred altar of the biggest and most important cathedral in the center of Moscow and sang a vulgar song about politics. How well would that have been received, by the way, in New York City or in Washington? Not terribly well. But what do we say about the treatment of women in Saudi Arabia or human rights abuses in Mexico or Pakistan? Not very much. So the Russian argument is that we're hypocritical and we're out to target them. The West has been deeply concerned, and understandably so, about Iran's nuclear program. But what about Pakistan? That's a country that's equally, probably more threatened by radical Islamist ideologies, and that has a, a vast nuclear arsenal already, and that is very likely to use it. That, in fact, keeps parts of it deployed because it's locked in a struggle of mutually assured destruction with its neighbor, India. Or why, lastly, are Russians made to watch while people in the Baltic states, in Poland, and other former communist countries in Eastern Europe are welcomed with open arms into NATO, even though they themselves have not rejected their ties to fascism and ideologies uh, that have targeted Russians, Jews, and others in their pasts? Why are the far right in those countries okay, but Russia's own radical nationalists are not? So this is the argument that the Russian leadership makes about Western hypocrisy. Now, why do we have to listen to all this stuff? Why does it matter? Well, Russia is the only country on the planet that can destroy the United States in under an hour. All of the United States. I don't just mean September 11th times 10 or 100. I mean every inch of the United States. And that's still true, guys. We don't talk about this stuff anymore. It is still 100% true. And it's still 1,000% terrifying. Russia is a swing vote on the United Nations Security Council. And what that means is not just that Russia is an obstacle. We have to somehow win them over or outplay them if we want to get something done on Libya or Iran or Syria in the UN. It means fundamentally if we think the rule of international law matters at all and we think international institutions matter, then we have to take Russia seriously because it is a central part of every single one of them. Russia is critical to resolving regional conflicts, Ukraine, Syria, Israel, Palestine, North Korea, you name it, the Russians are at the table. Russia has unique capabilities to deal with the 21st century challenges of disaster relief and cybercrime and trafficking. But more than that, it has unique ambition. And this is where the fact that Russia is relatively smaller than it was when it was the Soviet Union, and relatively weaker, and relatively poorer, and that it's not China, it essentially doesn't matter because Russia seeks that role, and Russia will marshal the resources necessary to play that role. Whereas you compare it to the Chinese, they are a great power that acts like a small power. And Russia may now be a small power, but it acts like a great power. And then, of course, there's one area in which Russia is undisputably great, and always will be, and that's size. I remember when President Obama dismissed Russia as just a regional power. I will never forget the response of the Russian ambassador in Washington who said, yes, I agree, as long as we agree that that region stretches from the Sea of Japan to the Baltic and from the Arctic to the Middle East. So Russia's region is essentially half the globe. <laughs> Russia's environment is critical to not only Russia, not only Eurasia, but the entire world. Lake Baikal contains 20% of the world's non-frozen fresh water just by itself. 
and then of course the vast forests and other natural reserves. And then there's this, energy. Russian gas, despite changes over the last several years, despite low prices for gas and oil, Russian gas is still critical for Europe's survival. Europe can't get through a winter without Russian gas. And then there's the size of the Russian market, 145 million consumers, the 10th largest world market, depending on how you slice it, sixth largest if you use purchasing power parity, large foreign currency reserves. Sure, they've been spending them in this period of economic crisis, but half a, bill, half a trillion dollars is still nothing to sneeze at. And Russians like to buy Western products. They love US products, especially. For many years in the post-Cold War period, Fords were the best-selling automobiles in Russia. They love American fashion. They love Hollywood movies. All right, so if we have so much in common and if Russia is so important to us, why are we in conflict? Well, let me start from the premise that this is indeed, as Bob suggested, the most serious conflict that we have been in. This isn't just a rhetorical conflict. Yes, there is a war of words going on. Yes, Russia has been isolated from the talking shops of the big diplomatic clubs like the G7, which used to be the G8, but without Russia, it's now the G7. But there have also been sanctions and counter sanctions. We have frozen practical cooperation and working level dialogue in the context of the bilateral presidential commission, which used to have some two dozen working groups working on everything from energy security to health to Arctic issues to security issues. And of course, there are enhanced military deployments. We'll talk more about that in the Baltic region and the Eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea region, pretty much everywhere where Russian and NATO forces come into contact, they're gearing up for war. But even worse than that, there's proxy war. This is uh, freeze frame footage of a Russian fighter plane being shot down by Turkish air defenses. Turkey, mind you, a NATO member country. Troubling that they had a military coup and that they're shooting down Russian planes. Big problems coming that way, I assure you. But worse than that, just two weeks ago, it was revealed that in June, Russian bombers actually struck a training camp in southern Syria where just hours before, American and British special forces had been in the camp, and they did it even though they got a direct warning from American airplanes that were in the exact same airspace. If that is not walking an incredibly dangerous line of conflict, I don't know what is. Now, things have been bad before. So, you might dispute the claim that this is the worst it's been since the worst of the Cold War. Well, let me walk you through the post-Cold War period. So in the 1990s, we had a bunch of well-meaning American advisors who went to Russia. We had a bit of the schadenfreude. You guys lost the Cold War. We're going to rebuild you in our image. A lot of backslapping between Bill and Boris. But then what did we do? We enlarged NATO. The one thing that Warren Christopher in 1993, I'm not even talking about Gorbachev. Gorbachev is long gone. In 1993, Warren Christopher, Bill Clinton's Secretary of State, goes to Zavidova, about an hour north of Moscow, and he tells Yeltsin in no uncertain terms, we have the transcript, NATO will not be enlarged. And Yeltsin says, wonderful, let's drink to it, and he gets drunk. And then he kind of whispers under his breath, well, at some point it probably will be. But Yeltsin didn't get the message, unfortunately. So the 1990s, absolutely, building towards crisis. We had revolutions in Ukraine and Georgia. In 2008, the Russians actually invaded Georgia. And then despite a reset in 2009, when Russians came out into the streets of the so-called white protest movement, white mostly because all the other colors had been taken, orange and red and blue and so forth, so they chose white, uh, Vladimir Putin accuses Hillary Clinton of actually orchestrating that protest movement. And indeed, there's some evidence that American uh, uh, advisors and American NGOs were absolutely involved with the Russian political opposition. Whether the CIA actually orchestrated this protest movement I can't say, but Vladimir Putin is certainly convinced. But it didn't stop there. The reset died many deaths. Ambassador Mike McFall, a former professor of mine from Stanford, uh, a well-known Russia expert, but also the author of Russia's Unfinished Revolution. When does he arrive? In the middle of that protest movement, and about three months before the sensitive moment when Putin is running for re-election. And then, of course, there's the Justice for Sergei Magnitsky Act. Remember I mentioned before the US constantly punishing Russia and berating Russia about its human rights record. This is a very tragic case where a young Russian lawyer who's working on behalf of an American uh, investor in Russia, who later, by the way, took British citizenship, even though he still asked the US government to protect him. Uh, this lawyer dies while in custody in prison. 
Uh, and in response to that, the United States slapped sanctions on a list of about a dozen Russians. By the way, two of the Russians who were sanctioned under that were security officials responsible for Chechnya in the North Caucasus. A couple months after that happened, then the Boston Marathon bombers, who had been in Chechnya and were of Chechen descent, surprise us all. Why didn't we know about it? Well, we had sanctioned the guys who would have been responsible for delivering the information to the FBI. Right now, we can, we can say saving lives should transcend politics, but maybe for those individuals it didn't. So very, very tragic moment there. And then, of course, this guy, Edward Snowden, uh, who is allegedly still living comfortably in Moscow. And then comes the Ukraine crisis. You all remember this from my lecture before. Remember, it starts with Ukrainian domestic politics, with this guy, Yanukovych, the corrupt, living in a palace, bilking the Ukrainian people with billions of dollars. But there's plenty of blame to go around because very quickly the conflict turns geopolitical. And there's blame here, and I mean this, on all sides. Not only the Russians who send in the little green men and seize Crimea and seize eastern Ukraine, uh, but the West, which eggs both sides on in many ways and continues to support this conflicting integration paths. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, Ukraine cannot join your club. It can only join our club. Why does all of this matter so much to Russia and the United States? Why, why does this history bring us to the conflict where we are right now? Don't take my word for this conflict. Um, let me quote a couple of rather influential individuals. Russia's actions in Ukraine challenge the post-World War II world order. That's President Obama. Russia's annexation of Crimea is a blatant violation of international law. That's Vice President Biden. And then there's this quote. There is an attempt to perturb the existing world order with one incontestable leader who wants to remain as such, thinking he's allowed everything, while others are only allowed what he allows and only in his interests. This world order will never suit us. Vladimir Putin, of course. So the leaders of the West and the leaders of Russia are in agreement that the current conflict is a conflict about world order. You didn't hear it from me, you heard it from them. Why would that be the case? What is world order? Where does it even come from? Is it from God, the theory of natural law? I went to law school after all, we learned about that stuff. Is it international law, which is practice and opinio juris, according to my international law textbook? Is it public opinion? Is it some document? Can you look it up in the UN Charter and find out, oh, that's what the world order is? Well, I subscribe to a different theory. I think that the world order is, as a couple of my colleagues have argued, more often derived from a consensus about what European states do than the other way around. In other words, there is not some world order out there, some abstraction that European states look at and go, oh, that's world order, so we can't do this. No, it's what European states, and I use that term advisedly, it's what they do and what they choose not to do that determines what are the rules of the road internationally. And that may change as China rises and India rises and Brazil rises and Turkey rises, but so far they're not willing to pay the costs of enforcing a world order. So when that changes, we'll know. But for now, Europe and North America, because of its close ties to Europe and Russia, will remain the key fora for deciding the rules of the game. Now, what are those rules? What could be said to be Europe's rules? I begin with the Helsinki Final Act of 1975. After 1991, it became the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is headquartered in the Hofburg, the former Grand Palace of the Habsburg Emperors in the center of Vienna. Nice symbolism there, right? It's very comfortable. Although it's kind of inside, it's mostly cubicles. It's, it's kind of depressing. Um, three important principles about the Helsinki World Order and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Political military, borders, armies, and weapons, should not be used to determine the political future of Europe. No more World War I's and World War II's when you want to adjust borders. It has to be done only through peaceful political processes. Number two, economic and environmental. The importance of trade and the importance of human interests like health and well-being. And then third, what's referred to as the human dimension. But this is essentially human rights. It was a bargain. The Soviet Union wanted the post-World War II boundaries of Central and Eastern Europe respected by the West, and we said okay. But the West, in return, got human rights as a concept. We got to say from 1975 onward, human rights matters in the countries of Europe, and you can't just throw up a barrier and say, sovereignty, sovereignty, we can kill 20,000 people in Hungary to put down a rebellion, and you don't get to say boo. 
So it was an important but fundamental bargain. It was a deal. That means each side gave a little in order to get a little bit. Now, what's happened since the Ukraine crisis? Borders, sovereignty, violated. Trade, environment, devastated. Human rights? Not so much. So are we on a path to a new Cold War? That's a natural question that many people ask. Well, there are some troubling similarities, I can tell you that much. There's been a shift to high levels of propaganda, demonization of the other side. The narrative is that the other side is completely at fault. How many Americans begin from the premise that we did something to cause this problem? Not a lot. They usually get laughed off the stage. How many Russians? None. Low expectations for cooperation from one another and this tit-for-tat punishment. Sanctions, counter-sanctions, we kick the Russians out of the G7, the Russians kick us out of their organizations, we freeze the bilateral commission and the NATO-Russia Council. This one I thought was very ironic. Last year, for an entire year, we had a Russian cosmonaut and an American astronaut up in the International Space Station, and while that was happening, we froze the NASA Roscosmos, which is the Russian Space Agency working group because it wasn't important for them to talk to each other. If you ever saw the movie The Martian, I was pretty sure there was gonna be a movie like that about these guys. They were just gonna go spinning off into space and no one would talk to each other. <laughs> Proxy conflicts, Ukraine of course, Georgia, which has its breakaway regions, Syria, Russia and the West fighting for influence in so many ways, not always militarily. Think about what's been going on in the post-Soviet space, places like Belarus and Kazakhstan where there haven't been wars, but there's a constant battle for influence. Greece, Hungary, Venezuela, far-flung places around the world where Russian money crops up, American money's been there all along, or American money crops up in the post-Soviet space, and we are fighting one another for influence. It smells an awful lot like Cold War. Okay, but it's not the Cold War, and why is it not the Cold War? First of all, we are coming out of an unprecedented period of Russia's engagement with the wider world and with the West in particular. Post-Soviet Russia has been so much freer than the Soviet Union ever was despite all of the limits and all the human rights abuses that we hear about. The post-Cold War generation, of which I'm a part and of which my Russian friends are a part, has established real connections and virtual connections and we are more connected than any Russians and any Americans have ever been in history. That's an extremely important difference because personal relationships matter. There's no global ideological struggle here. Basically, we agree about free markets, we agree about democracy, we dispute whether elections are legitimate, we dispute how, how money can be spent to influence elections, we dispute what you can do around elections in terms of manipulating people with information and blackmail, but guess what? We all do it. So fundamentally, this isn't communism versus capitalism, two all-encompassing systems that are battling each, out, each other for the future of the world. And another very important difference. There's a massive power imbalance today between the United States and the West on the one hand and Russia on the other hand, as distinct from the Cold War. For a quarter century, we have been, we the United States, have been the world's hyperpower. No one can come close to challenging us, and as a result, we are not in the habit of doing deals. We are not in the habit of deferring to what other people want. Why should we be? We get what we want simply by saying it's what we want. And this is why. Not just military power, economic power, demographic power, soft power of all kinds. We have it and the Russians basically don't. And if you compare it to the Cold War, it's very, very different. Because in the Cold War, the Russians had an ideology. It may have been hated, but they had it and it was credible and it was attractive to some people, and they had money and they spent it. It may have come off the backs and the sweat and the blood of their people, but they had it, and boy, did they have military power. And many times their military power eclipsed ours. But here's the biggest and the scariest difference. We're not afraid anymore. If you ask yourself honestly in your heart, do you really think that a nuclear war is possible? Should we practice a duck and cover drill every time we come to a large public space? The answer is, of course not, that's absurd. That's some absurd blast from the past. Well, is it? Really? I mean, after all, people are spelunking in missile silos. We've gotten rid of so many nuclear weapons. And yet, the reality is both Russia and the United States, and this is worth repeating, I know I said it before, both Russia and the United States have the capability to destroy each other multiple times over within an hour, and with that to destroy human life as we know it on this planet. We are not afraid enough, and that's a big difference from the Cold War. So as I've told you that it's not a new Cold War, 
I guess I've probably scared you a little bit too, haven't I? Well, the upside here is that I think a return to normalcy is still possible because it isn't a Cold War. The downside is I think the stakes are not yet high enough to force the kinds of serious concessions, the kinds of compromise, and even just the kind of dialogue that is necessary to get to that state. Why did Helsinki even happen in 1975? Why was that possible? Well, where were we coming from in 1975? Cuban Missile Crisis, Berlin Crisis, Hungary Crisis, Czechoslovakia, wars in the Middle East, Vietnam. We had reason enough to say enough. It is time to talk to one another across a table, and it is time to make an agreement. And of course, sworn enemies worked together during the Cold War. Reagan and Gorbachev are the famous examples, trust but verify. But Kissinger and Nixon and Brezhnev worked together, and many others. Now, intense personal enmity and distrust. And then there's these guys. We'll talk about them later. <laughs> We've also got a kind of what I call a Goldilocks problem with Russia. See, Russia's not China, which means we don't have billions or even trillions of dollars of economic interests wrapped up in that Chimerica relationship. So, oh my goodness, we wouldn't want to you know, rock that boat and risk our own well-being. So that's not a disincentive to conflict. But Russia's also not Iran. It's clearly not a millenarian, crazy, potentially terroristic actor that's just going to use its nuclear arsenal willy-nilly. No, we all kind of have confidence in the back of our minds. Well, you know, they're more or less like us. And it's true, they are more or less like us. So that's a Goldilocks problem. They're somewhere in the middle. And in the middle is where dangerous things are happening right now. And then we've got the structural problems of American politics. American politics favor confrontation over compromise. If you think about President Obama's commitment to the reset, to engagement, whether it was Russia, whether it was Iran, uh, whether it was Burma, sure, it paid off in some ways. But look at both candidates in 2016. They are both running to Obama's right on foreign policy. They are both trying to demonstrate how tough they are, despite this very strange Putin-Trump bromance. I think if anybody challenged him on the toughness card, he would say, no, I'm going to fight dictators around the world. But in Russia, it's the same. In Russia, anti-Americanism has become the currency of the realm. This is very different from the 1990s or even from the last decade. Right now, if you want to run for office in Russia, whether it's the highest office in the land or dog catcher in Novosibirsk, you have got to be against America and you have to mock President Obama, and you have to talk about obliterating this country into a pile of radioactive ash. That is a dangerous structural defect in our politics on both sides. Is there a way forward through all of this? I don't think anything is possible without settling what we talked about two years ago, what began two years ago, and what continues grindingly, bloodily, every single day, every week, and every month, and that's the Ukraine conflict. And we know how to solve the conflict. That's the tragedy, right? We have this Minsk framework. We know what that bargain is supposed to look like. But now I come back to that question of fear and motivation and drive. We don't have the political will to force that bargain on our guys, who are the guys in Kiev, and the Russians don't have the will to force it on their guys, who are the guys over there in Donbass. So it's not going to happen. Moreover, we're engaging in la-la land fantasies. When Vice President Biden goes to Ukraine, he doesn't go to visit a million refugees and ask, my God, what can we do to stop the conflict? What can we do so that these people stop suffering? No. He goes to talk about the importance of reform and democracy building and bringing Ukraine into the European Union, and that's all wonderful stuff. Except it's not happening. It's not happening under President Poroshenko. I told you a little bit about him two years ago. All I have to say is one word, oligarch. He is an oligarch, and that means a whole lot in the Ukrainian and Russian context. And yet, we're, we're trapped in this success narrative, right? Ukraine is reforming, it's getting democratic, it's getting better. The problem is, what's our plan B? What if that's not true? And the Russians, the same. They're trapped in a narrative that the Ukrainians are neo-fascists and Nazis, and all they want to do is slaughter Russians. Well, what if that's not true? What's your plan B? We're not interested in implementing the Minsk agreement, and that's the problem. It's motivation, it's not lack of a solution. I could write you 300 words right now about how to fix the conflict, but it'll never get implemented. We need to draw a moratorium, finally, on competing integration projects in the post-Soviet space. So just a couple of months ago, NATO 
trumpeted the welcome of Montenegro, a teeny tiny country that has one ship in its navy and 2,000 guys in its army and may be very, very deserving of NATO membership. But note the Montenegrin flag. You see the double eagle on there? That's the same double eagle on the Russian flag. These people have a long-standing, close connection through faith and history and so forth to Moscow. How do you think the Russians react to adding one more Slavic country in Eastern Europe to NATO at a moment like this? Not very well. So it's not only a time to freeze the expansion of Western integration projects. It's also a time to freeze the expansion of Russia's integration projects and to say, look, guys, until we can control the conflict that we have created here, we probably don't want to exacerbate it. We've got to reaffirm the Helsinki principles that I told you about. Borders change only peacefully and by mutual consent. No military forces can be on another state's territory without that state's consent. We need to gradually find a way to get out of the sanctions and counter sanctions and mutual isolation tra trap. Does that mean that we have to simply surrender? Of course not. But if we simply get into a dynamic of endless sanctions, we get Cuba. And I guarantee you five decades from now, some creative American politician will go, gosh, why do we have these sanctions? Why don't we lift them? We like Russian vodka and Matryoshka dolls, and we like Russian energy, so let's lift the sanctions. And we won't have gotten anything for it, other than that for 50 years, we'll have been utterly disconnected from the largest country in the world if we don't destroy each other in the meantime. I suggest it's time here for European leadership. Now, the credibility of European leadership has been severely stretched by Brexit, by the rise of the far right in Europe, and by many other challenges the Europeans face. But if Europe doesn't reassert a common foreign policy now on this issue of Russia and Ukraine and the future of the European and global peace and security order, then there will be no Europe, I submit to you. The future of the European Union and of the European idea and the idea of preventing wars between France and Germany and Poland and Britain in the future. It depends on this problem right here and now. And it's just as well that it does because we, America, we're distracted. We've got problems in the Middle East and Asia and Latin America. We have climate issues and terrorism. Russia, at the end of the day, still would rather be the biggest country in Europe than a junior partner to China. But most of all, Europe's got to deal with this problem because the costs of the problem won't be borne by us. They will be borne primarily by the Europeans themselves. Remember the old story about our NATO allies in Central and Western Europe? How they didn't want to see Americans and Russians fighting it out on German soil or French soil? That's the problem here is that when things go badly, they go badly for Europe first. And so Europe has to hitch up its britches and not just rely on Washington. You know, I have a colleague who says very wisely that America has benefited from having as its neighbors Mexico, Canada, and fish. It's quite a nice neighborhood. <laughs> but then I like to remind him that America's next closest neighbor after Mexico and Canada, and with the fish, is Russia. Russia's just three miles away, across the Bering Strait from Alaska. So whether you take Sarah Palin's version of that, or just, just a sober reminder that we live in the same space and we are part of the same Euro-Atlantic world. So, to conclude, what can Americans do? First of all, sanctions and pressure depends on having leverage in the first place. I'm reminded of the famous, give me a long enough lever and a place to stand and I can move galaxies, universes. Certainly something like the US-Russia relationship, but the problem is we don't have a place to stand and we don't have a lever. We've got to fix the dysfunctional trade relationship, where we have literally zero economic incentive to work together. And that's gone down ever since sanctions and low oil prices. It's very hard for Americans and Russians to travel back and forth. It's possible, but for those of you who've gone there, chances are you've had some kind of snafu, some kind of unpleasant administrative difficulty. Why have you had those? Because Russians just like to do that? No, it's tit for tat. It used to be that Americans required a urine sample to prove HIV negativity from Russians coming into the United States. What did the Russians do? They required a urine sample from us. So we've got to make it easier to trade. We've got to make it easier to travel. We've got to talk to Russia about difficult issues. Don't just look for good conversations, you know, the tiny little areas of overlap where we do agree. No, talk about the hard issues, because otherwise you're going to exchange bullets and not words. And then we need to know something about Russia. This was the fundamental insight of George F. Kennan 
the younger, the diplomat, the one who actually founded my institute. Kennan said, you can't do containment, you can't defeat the Soviet Union if you do not understand them first as Russians. So that's why it's a gigantic, titanic mistake that the United States government has cut what had always been a modest but still incredibly important investment in knowledge about Russia. And here you can see, since 2009, we have awarded in the United States of America four economics PhDs and five sociology PhDs focused on Russia. We have slashed dramatically the major government programs that fund study in Russia. And by the way, these numbers are not big. This is a $100 million program. This was originally a $14 million program. It's now down. It's actually lower than that now. It's below eight. And then Title VIII, which is a program of which I'm an alum, started as a lofty $4.5 million investment and was zeroed out in FY 2012. And then last of all, let me say to you, for those who haven't, for those who haven't been for a long time, and for those who've only seen a small part of Russia, go and see it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. The more Americans understand Russia, the more we can make wise choices, and the more we can exert the kind of patience and influence and confidence that's necessary to ultimately prevail in a peaceful relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. While the questions hopefully are being passed up quickly, let me ask one. From your knowledge of Russia and its leaders, what will the next U.S. president, one of the two pictures up there, have to do to be successful in negotiations, and what will they have to watch out for? And finally, if you want, uh, do you think that one candidate understands this better than the other. All right. Well, see, I knew I didn't have to include any of that in my talk because how could that not be question number one on an evening like this? Um, let me address the parts of it that uh, my status as a civil servant at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, a federally chartered memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, um, I hope you're understanding where I'm going with this, will, will allow me to say, um, and that is that, first of all, uh, we need to be very careful about our obsessive and our caricature and our abstraction approach to Russia. Russia isn't Putin and Putin isn't Russia. We don't know what's in Putin's mind. We don't have a crystal ball. We need to be very careful about jumping to conclusions about Putin is controlling this and Putin is doing that and Putin is pulling the strings. Because the reality is Russia is a country of 145 million people. And just like the United States is no one person or no one place, we have to understand Russia in a deeper and more refined way. So the first recommendation is what I ended with, which is just know something about Russia. The thing that terrifies me most of all, and I don't think I'm revealing state secrets by saying this, I brief for the US intelligence community on, on, on Russia and issues, various, various issues around Russia, and places like Belarus or Moldova, where I actually go and US officials almost never go. Uh, and, I, and it just blows my mind when I ask for a show of hands in the room, and I know that security clearance issues are part of it, and I ask how many of you have been to this place that we are talking about? I mean, you can go there. It's not North Korea. It's, you can go there. It's safe. And I'll get like less than a quarter of the hands in the room. And that's just befuddling to me. I mean, how can you purport to understand anything about a place, much less advise a president or a secretary of defense or a secretary of state if you haven't been to the place? So I think a, a reinvestment and taking fundamentally seriously this obligation to know thy enemy, if in fact they are that, would be where I'd start. The cruise also. Absolutely, yes, yes, we're doing it. You know, it's, it's funny. When I was here two years ago, this is complete happenstance because I haven't done it since. I was about, in, in September of that year, I was about to go on a Trans-Siberian train trip um, and I invited anyone who wanted to come to, to come along. And now I'm about to go on a, uh, in September, a Baltic boat trip, which I've never done before. I'm very excited about it. Um, but we'll be including Russia and the Baltic states, and it'll be a great opportunity to see this conflict up close. Nothing about particular people, but... Not going to okay. take the bait. A... <laughs> you had to buy me a drink first. Okay, there's a dinner. Uh, a suggestion has been made that the U.S. and Russia join forces militarily to defeat ISIS. Possible, and your thoughts about it, if 
Yeah, so, so first of all, um, Joining forces presumes that we know what our objective is. And, and, you know, look, I don't purport to be a Middle East expert, but the, the challenge that I see in Washington, uh, in, in U.S.-Russian conversations, but also just, just U.S.-U.S. conversations about Syria, is that no one seems to be very clear on what our objective is. So if we don't know what we want, so for instance, this is, this is a little bit like that sort of Ukraine success narrative problem I talked about when Vice President Biden goes and tells a great story about what the Ukrainians have, have achieved, whether it's true or not. Um, you know, we think that there is a moderate Syrian democratic alternative that's just waiting in the wings. That seems to be the premise of US policy. And Russians just see the world really differently. And I don't know enough about Syria to tell you for sure that they're, that they're right or wrong, but let me tell you what Russians see. They see ISIS, who are bloodthirsty murderers who will bring their murder to Europe, to America, to Russia as soon as they possibly can, and we know that, we, we have proof of that. And then they see a nasty, bloodthirsty dictator, but who presides over a semi-functional state with a semi-functional army, which has been their historic ally, and which can, with enough Russian support and maybe with Western support, at least defeat ISIS. That's the equation that they see. Americans don't seem to see the same equation, so how can we possibly cooperate? That's the problem. Of course we could cooperate, but we have to actually agree about what's going on and what we want before we can cooperate effectively. Let's move back to where you were a couple of years ago. Two questions. One, uh, the Crimean Peninsula has been part of Russia since the late 1700s. Should the U.S. acknowledge history and accept Crimea as being part of Russia? Uh, no. Oops. No. The answer is no. And, and the reason is uh, not because uh, we, we should be ignorant of history uh, or because there are not uh, many tens of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands actually of Russian speakers uh, and ethnic Russians in Crimea who, who do want to be in Russia. All those things are true. Um, but there was a basic bargain at the end of the Cold War, at the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. It was a bargain among the post-Soviet states themselves. The Russians signed on the dotted line as much as the Ukrainians did, and it said, we're gonna keep the borders that we had in Soviet times. That was the deal. And by the way, we're gonna keep all the stuff within those borders, all the stuff the Soviet Union built, weapons, factories, schools, parks. It's all yours if those happen to be your borders at the end of the war. And the Russians liked it, by the way, because they got to keep most of everything. Uh, including most of the military forces. But then they broke that deal. And their, and their specious rationale for doing so was that there was a threat to ethnic Russians in Crimea. The, the problem with that logic, and yes, it was a bloodless takeover of Crimea, and thank God that it was that. The problem with that logic was that no ethnic Russians were being massacred in Crimea. There was a lot of bad stuff happening in Kiev, and the Russians had a lot to do with that, as did the Yanukovych regime. But in, in actual fact, there was no evidence that they intervened a la you know, Bosnia or Rwanda or something to prevent a genocide in Crimea. There was no evidence that that was going to happen. So what they really did was they took the whole post-World War II geopolitical order that said borders matter and they can only be changed through peaceful negotiation and they upended it and they reintroduced to Europe the idea that military force that might makes right. A couple of questions which to link together. Do you think that the Soviet-US relationship has deteriorated more during the last eight years than earlier? And given that, or are there any military relationships still existing between US and Russia? Yeah, so, so I could go through a litany of, uh, for example, treaties and conventions and executive agreements uh, and tell you which ones are still valid and which ones either we've abrogated because we've abrogated some or the Russians have unilaterally or we've both just allowed to sort of atrophy into irrelevance, um, but it's a long list. And, and then I could tell you about some of the working groups and committees and mill-mill contacts and so forth that we had, but just take my word for it, we had all those things. We had this elaborate, elaborate infrastructure of security contacts between the Soviet Union and the United States until 1991. And some of them kind of limped along for a while afterwards. And now we have very, very little. And the few things that we had, like the bilateral presidential commission that I showed you, which had three different security-oriented working groups, 
and the NATO-Russia Council, which was created in 1991 when the Russians went, oh, wait, Warren Christopher, there was a second part to what you said, and you are expanding NATO, so we'd better have some role so we can be aware of what's going on, we could talk about what's going on. That was the arrangement we came up with, a NATO-Russia Council, because Russia never wanted to be a member of NATO just like any other country, to be dominated by America, the big hegemon within NATO. They always wanted to be a sort of counterpart to NATO, but they were willing to do it peacefully. So that was the NATO-Russia Council. Great institution, hasn't solved any problems, doesn't mean that you should kill it. Kind of reminds me of the United Nations, right? If we had to reinvent it today, we almost certainly couldn't do it, but we've killed it. So the answer is not very much. I have a couple more, and I assume there'll be more coming in, but. What, in your opinion, is Russia's endgame in Syria? Well, one thing I have to say by way of preface is that um, Russians, in so many ways, and I've described many of them, see the world very differently than the way Westerners tend to. Um, one of those ways is that at least on the part of the Russian leadership, I talked about the sense that the world is an unstable, dangerous, unpredictable place. So the notion that we would have a clean solution to a problem like Syria. We could tie it up with a bow and say, okay, now Syria is a democracy, check, problem solved, right? I mean, we kind of imagine, you know, ask yourself, we kind of imagine that that was what the goal was in Iraq, for example. And then we figured out, oh, that's not possible. Well, maybe it's endemically impossible. Maybe it never was possible. And so the Russian view in Syria would be, there isn't per se a day after Assad scenario where everything is peaceful. It may be, that the eastern deserts of Syria are forever a war zone of some kind of jihadis and rebels and guerrillas. And you know what? Maybe the Russians are willing to live with that. But the American and Western worldview, this sort of clean, neat, bow package that we have, that is not willing to contemplate that there will be an ISIS presence in eastern Syria indefinitely. So I think, again, we have this fundamental difference of worldviews. If the Russians help Assad or even just Assad's government to limp through the current period where they're under threat and come out whole on the other end and there's still something that more or less looks like Syria as it's always been along the coast and the Russians can, you know, do arms sales and energy deals with them and things go back to normal and Russia has an outpost in the eastern Mediterranean, hey, that's a good outcome. Stay in that part of the world for a minute. The question asks whether uh, we think that the recent Russian-U.S. nuclear agreement, I wonder whether they mean that, or I would add the, uh, the Iranian-U.S. Uh, agreement, right. will eventually lead to a Shia-Sunni war mm. that could have worldwide implications. Right, right. So, I mean, I, I think the question here is, uh, is not about the new start strategic nuclear agreement between Moscow and Washington, but rather, uh, which was uh, signed in 2010, but rather about the Iran deal that was signed just this year. Um, you know, the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. And the, the, the devil of the Iran deal is, yeah, it's, it's good. As long as Iran is not producing uh, weapons or weapons usable material, every minute that they are not producing that stuff, whether you trust them or not, uh, that's a good thing, that they're not doing it. Um, the problem is, when the agreement breaks down, and it, it probably will, just judging by history, almost every agreement that we have had uh, with the Iranians about their nuclear program has broken down at some point. At some point, they'll have an election, they'll have a protest, there'll be an attempted coup. Something domestic will throw everything into doubt. At that point, uh, will the Iranians instantly go nuclear, and then will, in response, will the Saudis reveal the reality that they probably already do have nuclear weapons somehow through Pakistan. You, you've probably read about these things. Uh, and, then, and then what do we have, right? We have mutually assured destruction uh, in the most volatile and I would argue scary piece of real estate in the world in which, of course, Russia and the United States will be directly implicated because we are the authors of that agreement. Two years ago when you were here, Matt, you talked about um, that the U.S. might be better off with Putin than some of the alternatives that were around in Russia, uh, in Russia then. Um, do you still agree, and do you think Putin is, quote, president for life? And if not, uh, how does he leave office? Toes up or some other way? Right. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. I, I, love, I love that question. So first of all, uh, I said Putin is a Tsar. Putin is a Tsar. Okay? Full stop. Uh, there has never been a peaceful succession of a Tsar of a Soviet leader, it doesn't happen, okay? And it's not gonna happen with Vladimir Putin either. Uh, 
And that's for the simple reason that if he gives up power, it's not just power that he's giving up. It's wealth, it's personal security, it's all the levers of information control that he needs in order to maintain his own interests, his own safety, his family's safety. Remember, this guy has been incredibly effective at concealing from Global Spotlight his two daughters who have been living in Europe. You can't do that if you are not the president of Russia and in control of Russia's elaborate and vast intelligence apparatus and all the wealth of the Russian state. Are we okay with that? Should we be okay with that? And what could potentially come after Putin? I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, I don't know whether there'd be something like a palace coup. I think it's probably unlikely, but um, what's great about my field is you never get punished for being wrong. You just have to be entertaining. Um, <laughs> What, what I can tell you for sure is if you look at history, in the last 15 years, Vladimir Putin took a Russia that was being spun apart, utterly destroyed by competing forces that you will all remember, mafiosi, uh, Islamist and secular separatists in the North Caucasus and other parts of Russia, powerful regional political leaders, governors, former generals, who were trying to break away their regions or just sort of running private fiefdoms. There were murders on the streets of Moscow and St. Petersburg. He took all of that and he co-opted it into that splendidly isolated Russian state that I showed you before. Okay? If Vladimir Putin goes, do you think that there are institutions that maintain that order without his personality at the helm? Of course not. Russia's not built on institutions. It's built on personalities and on no one's more than Vladimir Putin. So what I would worry about, so again, I don't know the answer. I don't know what comes next. I don't know if we should want it or not want it, but what I would tell a president or a secretary of state is be very careful what you wish for, because you may suddenly have to be dealing with 20 or 30 or 1,000 very dangerous, very unpredictable people, some of whom will have their hands on the trigger for Russia's nuclear arsenal. Combining a couple, um, Presumably, Russia ha and Putin have aspirations to expand geographically, go back to the original Soviet Union, or just to make sure they have ports in Ukraine. Um, on one part of this is, how far what do you think they will go to expand in the north, in the Balkan states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania? And to put it in the context of our election, since Mr. Trump does not seem to want to uh, support part of NATO, mm -hmm. uh, and his campaign manager has worked with the Ukraine for many years, uh, if they are elected, is that a signal for Russia to try to reestablish a Soviet Union? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we used to play this uh, computer game in law school called the objections game, and I would have objected, compound question. There are like nine questions built into that, but let me, let me do my best. I didn't go to Stanford. So. Okay. Um, that's mostly what we did, actually, was play computer games about objections. Uh, all right, first of all, first of all, what you gotta know, uh, condensing a thousand years of Russian history into 10 seconds, is when Russia is territorially growing, the Russian people tend to live well at home, okay? So, so the guy on his farm or in the city in a shop uh, or in the Kremlin is, is, is living better. When Russia is contracting territorially, when it's being pushed back from the outside, Russians are living worse. They're suffering famines and droughts and plagues and, and invasions and rape and pillage and all that stuff. So the association in the sort of historic collective consciousness of Russians is expansion, we live well, contraction, things are bad for us. Now, that doesn't tell you anything about the extent of the expansion or the pace of it or the means of it, right? So arguably Russia is in an expansionist phase right now. But I would argue that the kind of expansion that Russia seeks is not mostly to be understood through the lens of Ukraine. It's not mostly through territory. Because actually what's interesting in Ukraine is they only annexed Crimea. See, they didn't annex eastern Ukraine, and it's not because they couldn't conquer it. I mean, if you look at the map, eastern Ukraine's completely surrounded by Russia. They could have conquered it in literally two days if they'd wanted to, and to annex it. Yes, they'd have fought an insurgency and so forth. But the reason they didn't do that is because occupying it and letting it remain Ukraine's problem, and by extension the West's problem, gives them leverage. It gives them the ability to prevent outcomes, to cause just enough trouble 
to prevent things from happening in Ukraine, like successful democratic reforms and integration into the European Union and so forth, that they don't want. And so I would argue that the new expansion phase of Russia that we're going to see is an expansion of Russia's levers of influence all around its borders in the post-Soviet space and even back into the Warsaw Pact region, Central and Eastern Europe. If you think about the money Russia is spending in uh, Hungarian politics and Greek politics and Slovak politics, this stuff's all out in the press. It's about influence, not so much territory. Crimea is a kind of misleading exception in that way, even Syria, for example. And will they go into the Baltic states? I think that this is a bit of a red herring, and I think the Russians love it. Let me tell you why. So first of all, it is critical that the Baltic states are in NATO. That's an absolutely critical difference, right? So damaging what, whoever it is and whatever they do, it damages the credibility of the NATO deterrent, of course, of course. Uh, that is going to make conflict with NATO member states that are close to Russia, more likely, not less. But the reason I think that a Russian invasion of the Baltic states, now that's not, that doesn't exclude you know, Russian meddling, right? Money, politics, broadcasting, propaganda, and so forth but an actual Russian invasion is very unlikely, is because look at what happened when NATO stationed its, uh, or, or uh, announced that it was going to station its 4,000 new troops in the Baltic states in Poland to deter Russia. The Russians said that they were outraged and that there were going to be Russian countermeasures. But what did they do? They announced the headquarters of three new military divisions about 1,000 kilometers away, all around eastern Ukraine. Because at the end of the day, they don't care about invading the Baltic states. They know NATO's there. They know those places are in NATO. They're going to mess with them. They're going to cause trouble. And they're going to continue to distract us with the red herring. But they care much more about Ukraine. And you can see that. Just look at the satellite maps. Where are their troops? They're not on the, on the borders of the Baltic states. Energy, oil, and gas, where Russia has a lot. It's exporting to Europe. Um, the question here is, uh, do you see that the discovery of oil and gas off the coast of Israel, uh, which I hadn't heard much about, uh, is a threat to Russia's hold on energy in Europe, or are there other threats to Russia's hold on energy in Western Europe? Look, the, the, the nature of, of threats, I mean, you can, you can take this kind of uh, fortress Russia worldview, Technically, if a Russian fortress would be called a Krem, Kremlin, Kreml. Uh, okay. Anyway, it was a little linguistic joke. Um, <laughs> next time, next time we'll do basic Russian 101. Um, so, if you take the Kremlin's kind of you know under siege mentality, then absolutely everything that happens in global energy markets is a threat, right? I, I, I have been in Moscow and heard news about any number of developments which kind of those of us who as kind of casual observers, maybe, you know, casual retirement oriented investors would say, oh, I don't know, that doesn't seem that promising. And the Russians are up in arms about it, right? And they're going to OPEC and they're going to the Saudis and they're trying to, you know, manipulate oil markets or gas markets and so on. Uh, but that's much more about mentality than it is about reality. The reality is there's never going to be cheaper or more plentiful gas for Central and Eastern Europe than gas that is sent through gigantic already existing pipeline infrastructure from West Siberia, which is part of the same landmass, directly into Europe and then distributed through a pipeline distribution network that's already built. In other words, when people talk about what's the most efficient, environmentally friendly car you can drive, the answer is the car you're already driving, right? And so, yeah, you know, Israel makes a difference, fracking, uh, you know, heck, if they discovered gas in China, it'd be a real problem and the Russians would be very nervous about it. But for Europe, the dependency is already there. A last question, maybe, but hopefully a little more hopeful. Uh, are there areas where either Kerry and Lavrov or their successors or others uh, can make advances in cooperation specifically that we should look, up to look for? Yeah, so, so uh, Bob and I chatted a little bit about this one earlier, and this gets into the dynamics of our two systems. And um, it's, <laughs> the, the answer is actually um, surprisingly the same for the Russian system and the American system, and that's that Kerry and Lavrov are messengers. I mean, fundamentally, right? Um, John Kerry is an extremely capable, experienced guy from the Senate and, and as a diplomat and so on, but he's not the decider. That, for now, is President Obama, and after President Obama, it'll be the next president. Um, in the Russian system, 
Do I even have to tell you? Of course. You know, Lavrov spins beautiful castles in the sky, and he's a very, very effective player at the kind of diplomatic cat and mouse game. He will never concede a single point. Listen to the guy's press conferences. They are masterful. I mean, if, if you ever want to see what sort of true uh, worldly diplomacy is, Lavrov is fabulous. But, you know, he alone doesn't solve problems because he doesn't make important decisions. So what, the fact that the two of them are meeting all the time I find very, very interesting because I view it as an imitation of U.S.-Russia dialogue rather than actual U.S.-Russia dialogue. It's like a substitute for what needs to be happening rather than the actual process. We are done for now. Um, I don't think you were wrong. But you were entertaining. And uh, we appreciate your coming back out again. Uh, this is an evolving subject. And even if we were given the number of people who say they've been to Russia, many of us may have been there a long time ago. You keep up with it. You know what the pulse is. You know what's going on. And we appreciate your sharing it with us.